call the meeting to order. Please be seated. All right, a motion to reconvene the uh, open meeting. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carry. We have a number of proclamations here. Um, our first proclamation is uh, Kids Sport and Councillor Johnson. You're reading that proclamation. You worship uh, from the office of the Mayor, City of Burnaby, proclamation regarding Kids Sport Week in Burnaby. Whereas Kids Sport Burnaby has provided annual sport registration grants to more than 3,000 financially disadvantaged children since 2001. This represents a contribution of just under $360,000, which allowed the children to participate in 33 different sports. And whereas Kids Sport removes the financial barriers that prevent some children from experiencing the benefits of season of sport and encourages and promotes the support of local businesses, professional sport, and the community at large in this endeavor. And whereas sport participation provides benefits extending beyond improving physical health to enhancing academic performance, providing growth of social skills, developing leadership abilities, and instilling a sense of fair play and the value of teamwork. And whereas nationally, kids sport is comprised of a network of 11 provincial slash territorial kids sport chapters and 178 community kids sport chapters. And whereas the city of Burnaby recognizes the outstanding contributions made by kids sport Burnaby to the youth of our city, you therefore, Mayor Derek Corrigan, Mayor of Burnaby does hereby proclaim the week of September 6th to 13th, 2015, as Kids Sport Week in the City of Burnaby. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. And Literacy Month, Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Office of the Mayor, a proclamation. <coughs> Whereas the gift of reading opens the door to a world of imagination, enrichment, and economic opportunity like no other. And whereas in our knowledge-based society, literacy is the building block of lifelong learning. And whereas proficient literacy skills equip people with to the tools needed to provide for themselves and their family. And whereas literacy plays a crucial foundational role in the creation of sustainable, prosperous, and peaceful societies. And whereas September the 8th is International Literacy Day and September 27th is Essential Skills Day. And whereas Literacy Now Burnaby and its many partner organizations through their work in our community demonstrate their commitment to building and enhancing literacy programs, services and networks in Burnaby in order to support a culture of literacy and learning. Now therefore Derek R. Corrigan, Mayor of Burnaby does hereby proclaim September 2015 as Literacy Month in the City of Burnaby. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Jordan. And with us uh, tonight is the Chief Librarian, Adel Tona Regala, and, uh, and with her is Sue Capcart, the Community Literacy Coordinator. I wanted to bring down a copy of our proclamation so that you could hang it at the Metro Town Library. All right, um, Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Councillor Dollywall, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Office of the Mayor of the City of Burnaby Proclamation, Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas prostate cancer is the most common cancer to affect Canadian men, and whereas one in eight Canadian men will be diagnosed with the disease in his lifetime, and whereas an estimated 23,600 Canadian men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer this year. And whereas the survival rate for prostate cancer can be over 90% when detected early. And whereas those with the family history of the disease or those of African or Caribbean descent are at a greater risk of, re of developing prostate cancer. And whereas Prostate Cancer Canada recommends that men get a PSA test in their 40s 
to establish their baseline. Now, therefore, Derek Corrigan, Mayor of Burnaby, does hereby proclaim September 2015 as Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Signed, Derek R. Corrigan. Thank you, Councillor Dollywell. And uh, Taekwondo Kukiwan Day, Councillor Paul McDonnell. Thank you. Paul is the mayor of the city of Burnaby, proclamation. Taekwondo Day, Taekwondo Kukiwan Day. Whereas Taekwondo is a Korean martial art, meaning the way of the hand and foot, and is practiced in over two, 200 countries worldwide. Whereas Taekwondo has been, official, been an official Olympic sport since the year 2000 and is practiced by people of all ages and backgrounds. And whereas the tenets of Taekwondo comprise of courtesy, integrity, perse perseverance, self-control, indomitable spirit are universal and articulated in a global standard for conduct of practitioners. And whereas Taekwondo academies and clubs worldwide are committed to improving people's lives through the practice of sport by instilling valuable life skills and building a strong triunity of mind, body, and spirit. And whereas Kukiwon is the headquarters of Taekwondo worldwide, established in Seoul, Korea, South Korea, in 1972. And whereas Kukiwon is a leading authority promoting Taekwondo to develop leaders, strength, global communities, and is the only authority in the Taekwondo world to issue a black belt certificate. Whereas the BC Korean Culture Heritage Society and the BC Taekwondo Federation are proud to initiate and support the proclamation of Taekwondo Kukiwan Day in the city of Burnaby. Now therefore, Derek, Moore, Derek Corgan, Mayor of Burnaby, do hereby, does hereby proclaim Wednesday, August 8th, 2015, as Taekwondo Kuki Wan Day in the city of Burnaby. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm going to bring this down in just a moment for presentation, but I wanted to just make a, a couple of uh, comments. I know that we have uh, Taekwondo uh, practitioners here with us uh, tonight, um, and we have developed a very special relationship with our Korean uh, community as a result of uh, our involvement in Taekwondo. Um, first of all, we have been very fortunate to have the Korean festival here in Burnaby. And one of the big features to attract people to that festival is the Kukiwan Taekwondo team that has been here in Burnaby for two years now. And uh, they do a tremendous performance of Taekwondo skills. If you haven't seen it, it is a sight to behold. These are young athletes at their very prime who are chosen from all over Korea and who have, uh, have taken Taekwondo to not only an athletic endeavor but an art. And it is a, a very special event for us to have the opportunity to see. Um, moreover, uh, Kukiwan has kind of adopted Burnaby as a, a home in, in Canada. And uh, Kukiwan is the school in Seoul. It is the central school that gives a pro um, approval of all um, grades of Taekwondo. It is a very important institution in Korea. And uh, they have uh, developed a great relationship with our Korean community here in Canada and with the city of Burnaby. And they were so kind as to, uh, as to give me an honorary black belt in Taekwondo. <laughs> There'll be, there'll be no comments from the peanut gallery, uh, <laughs> Councillor McDonnell. I, um, and my hands are a deadly weapon. Actually, there's a lot of people who think my mouth is a deadly weapon. <laughs> I, uh, I do, though, want to recognize this, uh, this friendship that we've developed, a very special one. And, uh, and Taekwondo, to, to compare it to something we know about, is Taekwondo in Korea is like hockey in Canada. It is the, the sport that really emulates the spirit of the Korean people. And, uh, and I think it, it's when, when they talk about the character traits that are necessary for Taekwondo, they're the character traits that Korean families want to see built in to their children during the time they're growing up. And so Taekwondo is a very important part of their lives. 
and we're going to visit our sister city in uh, Wasong, and um, we have arranged a very special opportunity in Seoul to be able to go to the Kukiwan School, which will be a very special experience for me. I uh, can promise you, Council, that I won't fight anybody there, <laughs> even though I have a black belt. And this now gives me a new excuse for avoiding any confrontations. I mean, I can't fight because I have a black belt. <laughs> anyway, this is uh, the first Taekwondo Kukiwan Day we've had in the city of Burnaby. I hope we can proclaim it every year here. And I hope what we do is we inspire other cities to proclaim a Taekwondo Day in their community. And uh, I think all of us can agree that not only is it an athletic achievement, but it is one of the great character building sports in our society. And it's one that I think any young person, whether they're of Korean heritage or from any other country in the world, they would benefit from becoming a Taekwondo practitioner. So I want to thank the, uh, the Kukiwan School and all of my friends here for the great honor they bestowed on me. I'm looking forward to visiting the headquarters for Taekwondo in Seoul. And now I'd like to come down and make a presentation of this proclamation to uh, a good friend, Mike Sook, who is here today. And Mike is himself a Taekwondo practitioner, and uh, I believe you represented Canada, is that right? So he had the great pride to be able to represent Canada as a Taekwondo practitioner. So this is very special to be the first city to proclaim Taekwondo Day. Thank you. I'll come down, Mike. Any of you who would like to remain for security are welcome to do so. And uh, we'll move on now to our next proclamation. Councillor Balco, you're doing Union Label Buying Week. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, proclamation from the uh, Office of the Mayor of the City of Burnaby. Union Label Buying Week. Whereas organized labor has always endeavored to maintain and improve good working conditions and wage standards for Canadian workers. And whereas labor's distinctive emblems of quality and service are union labels, shop cards, store cards, and service buttons, and whereas the Canadian Labor Congress Union Label Trades and Services Department is sponsoring a Union Label Week to salute these unique hallmarks and to promote Canadian union-made goods and services, now therefore Derek Corgan, Mayor of Burnaby, does hereby proclaim the week of September 7th to 13th as Union Label Buying Week in the city of Burnaby and call upon all citizens to support the products and services identified by the union label, store card, shop card, and service button. Thank you, Councillor Balco. And uh, for those of you who are wondering if we always have these many proclamations, as we were off in August, so they accumulated. Big night for our proclamations. So we're going to move on to the rest of the agenda now, and you're all welcome to stay if you would like to. But if you've got other things to do tonight, please, this would be a good time for everybody to move out. Delegation. Oh, do we have a delegation? Oh, oh, okay, good. I've got them coming up. Well, then why did you make me do this now? So you can repeat it after. Okay, come on up. Motion the delegation be heard. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. I'd forgotten you're on the delegation list too. All right. And if you will introduce yourselves, please. Welcome, please. Uh, 
Yeah, we've got their mic isn't working properly. Testing, testing. Is that good? No. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Uh, once again, so we would like to thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, Mayor Corrigan, all the honored counselors here uh, for this opportunity for us to present. We have the full support of the BC Taekwondo Federation as well as the KCHS. President Master Song Chul Kim and President Mr. Pilwan Suk are here in attendance as well. And together our organizations with the support of Kuki One and of course some very proactive and helpful, helpful people here in Burnaby are focused on helping children, youth and adults live healthy and productive lives through the practice of Taekwondo. Lots of people, especially today's youth, face challenges with focus respect and perseverance and Taekwondo helps to inspire and improve these qualities. Taekwondo Day in Burnaby will benefit so many people in so many ways. Please allow me to uh, show a quick introductory uh, Taekwondo video that highlights some of the physical and mental benefits. This. That's Thank a you. very cool video. So there is uh, just another minute and a half clip. Uh, the next part of this video highlights how several schools in the U.S. are also using Taekwondo as part of their program. And uh, there's also a testimony from the school principal and uh, the city mayor as well. In sports in an elementary school didn't make a lot of sense because we have 400 kids and you can only put 10 or 12 kids on a baseball team and everything else. So let's think about this. I am now the coach of uh, the team of 400 <laughs> kids who are all taking Taekwondo. They're all on, on the team no matter what type of kid it is. Um, if he has any physical disabilities or learning disabilities or what, they're all on the team. So we're working together for one cause. I like Taekwondo because it teaches you to be respectful and it teaches you to love others and I like to get exercise a lot so this is one of the most important sports to me. Different, different results every year. You know, not only do the kids learn to uh, persevere more in the classroom, they don't give up as easily as they used to. I would have never have thought of that. <laughs> but when you see there, you know, sit there and experience it, quite the thing. It, it is good for us because otherwise we'd just be sitting at home watching TV and the children will be fighting. So when we're there, we have fun, we laugh, 
and we're tired, but we come home and, you know, we have Taekwondo to talk about together and it, it's shape. really good. Yep, and getting better shape. No, it's sleep. Sleep. Yeah, it helps us sleep better. We're happy we've been able to expand it to all of our elementary schools. So that's uh, essentially the grades uh, up through the fifth and sixth grade. We'd like to be able to bring it further into the middle schools and get those kids in grades six, seven, and eight who have already been exposed to it at the lower grade levels to continue on. We know that the parents are very happy with the program uh, because of the discipline uh, that it imposes on the kids and I think also it boosts their self-esteem that they can go through this program and be successful in it. What city was that? I was in Chicopee. What? Chicopee. No. That's the city. I don't know what state that's in. No. <laughs> Sorry. So um, we are very proud to be working as a united front uh, with the KCHS, uh, with Kukiwan and Taekwondo BC, and of course the city of Burnaby. As the pro proclamation stated, Taekwondo is a worldwide art and sport that is founded on the tenets of Taekwondo and respect. Taekwondo benefits people physically and mentally, but the greatest payoff are the life skills that one can utilize in everyday life. We already know that sports are great because they promote good qualities, but there is a profound difference between conventional sports and Taekwondo. A school teacher once asked me, Master Cook, you say that Taekwondo helps children develop so many things, and I'm sure it does, but what's the difference between Taekwondo and soccer or swimming? Don't all sports teach good life skills? Now that's a great question, and I responded, yes, all sports are great, but here's the difference. In most team sports or individual sports, you learn things like teamwork and perseverance, but you learn them in a very indirect way. In Taekwondo, you learn these skills in a very clear, direct, life-changing way. Now let's take respect for example. In Taekwondo, instructors and clubs all over the world teach students respect in a very direct, methodical, and easy to understand way. They begin by number one, teaching what the word respect means. Be good to oneself and others. Treat oneself and others in a positive, encouraging way. Number two, the word respect is used often, repeated very often. It's very common to hear the word respect over 20 times in a one-hour practice session in Taekwondo. How many times do you hear it in a swimming session or a soccer session? Respect is modeled. That is, the physiology of the word respect is demonstrated by bowing, smiling, and being gentle. And finally, Taekwondo encourages and challenges the students to display and show respect each and every day to their parents, to teachers, to authority, and to each other and classmates, even people they don't like, because respect is something that is given, since we are all different but good. Taekwondo teaches all of these life skills in this specific way. The BC Taekwondo Federation is the official PSO, which is the Provincial Sport Organization for Taekwondo. We have the support of some fabulous clubs here in Burnaby, and they are here in attendance with us today. I'd like to thank Grandmaster Seo Jung Gil, Grandmaster Chang Am Young, Master Jason Ruder, Master Wee Fan, and Master Malad Barami, and of course, our provincial president, Master Song Cho Kim, for your continued efforts and support of building stronger communities through Taekwondo. We'll be working together to create the next steps for Taekwondo, Kuki One Day, in Burnaby. Mayor and Council, on behalf of the Korean Cultural Heritage Society and the tens of thousands of Korean Canadians in British Columbia, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize and thank the City of Burnaby for its generous, ongoing support of our community. Burnaby's consistent and long-term contributions are unquestionably paramount. The offering of city spaces like Central Park, 
for the annual Korean Veterans Tribute and the housing of the Ambassadors of Peace statue, the investment into the educational and cultural exchange programs with Hwasong City, the multiple city grants that empower events like the Korean Literary Festival, and even my per personal favorite, the Korean Cultural Heritage Festival at Swangard Stadium. This latest proclamation to honor the world's most celebrated martial art, Taekwondo, yet again demonstrates Burnaby's ongoing commitment to our community, to which we are deeply indebted once more. Thank you. As you may know, the Korean Cultural Heritage Society is a BC organization that fosters interculturalism. We serve to unite and enrich Canadian lives by sharing and promoting the very best aspects of our heritage so that these elements may be accepted and integrated to further strengthen the cultural fabric of British Columbia. As Master Cook has mentioned, increasing awareness of Taekwondo in our communities will enrich the lives of our citizens by promoting key values, values of respect, loyalty, discipline, and mutual compassion, values Korean Canadians hold very dear. As good order is the foundation of all things, in the months ahead, we look forward to working with Kukiwon and the BCTF to appropriately launch the Taekwondo Kukiwon Day, also known as TKD. Kukiwon Day Ukundo is so that it may be more than just a date on the calendar, but a date that actually positively impacts citizens, encompassing anti-bullying, women's self-defense, and addressing mental health and special needs in our community. I am proud that tonight's announcement, Mayor, of TKD in Burnaby is the first of its kind in Canada, and that Burnaby will be recognized as the inspiration for more jurisdictions to follow. Our com community is comprised of various organizations, and uh, we'd like to say uh, a special thanks to the following associations. The Korean Seniors Asso Society, the Korean Veterans Association, the Korean Marine Corps, the Korean War Veterans Association, the former Korean Society President, Mr. Chun, is here with us today. The Vietnam War Veterans Association and the Rose of Sharon Women's Society. Mayor and Council, once again, on behalf of our 16 directors and our 200 volunteers, all our affiliated organizations and the 80,000 Korean Canadians of BC, I'd like to thank you for your ongoing support, deep respect for our heritage, and this monumental proclamation. Kamsamila. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for being here with us today. And uh, I, I neglected to mention that, um, that we also, I thought this was a, a wonderful thing they did, is the uh, Kukiwan athletes went and uh, had a performance at the Edmonds Community Center and brought it into the Edmonds area. And, and people from all over that community were able to see the performance uh, right there in, in, on their... Uh, on the Civic Square in Edmonds, and it was tremendous. And then I went up to uh, Simon Fraser University for the provincial championships and, uh, and saw some of the participants from all over the province, the variety of ages of people who were engaged in uh, Taekwondo. But what really impressed me and, uh, and brought a tear to my eye was when there were, um, there were developmentally challenged young people who were brought forward to do a stylistic presentation of the Taekwondo moves. And they worked so hard at performing those moves in a way that was appreciated by the whole audience and every other Taekwondo athlete that they thought they'd won a gold medal um, for the performance. And they did in everybody's heart. And that was, uh, I thought, a, a great asset of Taekwondo, the fact that they draw in everyone from all different aspects of life. It's not about just the best, best athletes performing, it's every athlete having an opportunity to perform. And, uh, and I thought that was a, a very special quality of Taekwondo. And I encourage more people in our community to become involved, go out and see how your Taekwondo organization works, uh, get an idea about it. And, and I, I think the asset you get out of it is something that not only build your body, but build your character. And I, I think that's a very important thing for children who are growing up. So thank spoken, you very much. Spoken like a true black belt champion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and ambassador. Uh, I greatly appreciate you being here with us tonight. There's just a few more uh, people we'd like to thank, and uh, we'll wrap it up in the last minute here. 
Uh, so again, this would not have been possible without the support of some very incredible, uh, supportive and passionate people. And first off, I would like to thank you, Your Worship, Mayor Derek Corrigan, for your continued leadership and vision for the city of Burnaby. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I'd like to thank the president of the KCHS, Mr. Piwan Suk, for his amazing contributions to the Korean community and supporting us from day one. I'd also like to thank our BC Taekwondo Federation president, Master Song Chul Kim, for his dedication to the growth of this art, not just in BC, but worldwide as, as well. And of course, to all of our honored counselors uh, for your proactiveness, uh, for seeing how beneficial this can be to the community. Um, I want to thank Councillor Paul McDonald for being a champion on this for us, Councillor Pietro uh, Calendino, uh, Councillor Ann Kang, who I know is not with us today, and uh, Councillor James Wang, who's also uh, absent, but uh, he was very helpful in our efforts as well, uh, Councillor Sav Daliwal, and Councillor Dan Johnston, uh, Councillor Nick Volkow, and uh, Councillor Colleen Jordan. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, for seeing the potential of this proclamation. And to all of the volunteers and all the people behind the scenes who helped make this happen. And last but not least, I, I want to thank, and the KCHS would like to thank, uh, Burnaby's MLA, Jane Shin. Always humble, but always taking action. Thank you, Jane, for your support and for being a pillar in the Korean community and making this proclamation a reality. Uh, so to everyone, once again, we say thank you. And in Korean, we say, Kamsamida. And Council, I, I just wanted to mention that, uh, that MLA Jane Shin, the MLA for Burnaby Lowheed, is here with us tonight. Big supporter of Kukiwan Taekwondo and uh, a hard worker in our community for everyone, not just the Korean community, but for everyone in our community. Thank you for being here with us, uh, MLA Shin. All right. And uh, that was a nice way to start a meeting. Thank you very much. Moving on then to the minutes. A motion to adopt the uh, minutes of the Open Council meeting held on July the 20th, 2015. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. A uh, motion to adopt the minutes of the public hearing zoning held on July the 21st, 2015. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Um, a motion, oh wait, correspondence. A motion to receive the correspondence. And this is the Lower Mainland Local Government Association membership dues. And I think we need a motion to pay those been moved in the seconder. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. And a motion to resolve into a committee of the whole to consider reports. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, carried. And the first report is from the city manager and it's in regard to the pro proposed Trans Mountain expansion project update. Mover, please. So moved. moved and seconded. And speakers on this item. I'm going to have to get the speakers up on mine. There we go. Councillor Valco. Well, thank you, Your Worship. I just want to, I'm going to try to be very brief on this, but I, I wanted to start out by first thanking staff for uh, doing this report and giving us a chronology and reminding us exactly what this issue is all about. <laughs> I um, thought that this process couldn't become more warped or corrupted than what I've witnessed over the last two years in regards to this, but lo and behold, it could and it did. And I'm referring to July the 31st of this year when the uh, Conservative government of the day, as their last act before dropping the writ for the federal election that we're involved in, the longest federal election in the history of this country by a mile, on July the 31st, they appointed a gentleman named Stephen Kelly to the National Energy Board. And I thought, well, who pays attention to that until you discover who Stephen Kelly was? And Stephen Kelly is one of the main people that when the city launched our dispute with the NEB in regards to the Kinder Morgan project, 
Stephen Kelly was one of the main proponents and consultants that was working on behalf of Kinder Morgan and, and put forward the report which the NEB is, ba is probably going to base a, a, a lot of their decisions on. Well, what became even more strange was that last Friday, and I just point to the date on the report that we're looking at here, the date that this report was issued uh, via the city manager's office is August the 19th, which was last Wednesday. Friday, the 21st, just this last Friday, all of a sudden the NEB suspended the hearings which were supposed to start again on September the 3rd. And at one point uh, the hearings were supposed to take place here in the city of Burnaby, which would have been convenient for a lot of the interveners that uh, had applied. And it was going to be held at the Delta Hotel and all kinds of security personnel were seconded from all over the place and the Delta Hotel was was uh, being locked down by all kinds of our agencies in regards to the hearings to make sure that uh, there were no disruptions. But on August the 21st, they were, the hearings were suspended and uh, apparently when they do start up again will be taking place again in Calgary apparently. But I guess my question is, which I, I haven't had a, an answer to yet, is what happened in the intervening three weeks? that all of a sudden the NEB discovered that there might be a problem with Mr. Kelly's appointment. But then if you read a little further, there was no problem according to the NEB. And then all of a sudden there is a problem. So it's all very weird. As the last act before you drop the writ for an election, this is the decision that you take is to basically stack the deck against the Canadian people when it comes to the hearings in regards to this project. And I just wanted to read one little thing I was looking around and the thought had occurred to me and I thought where does this saying comes from and the saying is a fish rots from the head so I took a look around and it's a very universal saying and it's respected in Asia the Asians are well aware of it and it goes way back to middle Europe and it talks about the corruption of an organization is what the term is is used for and so I found this article which was printed on November the 21st, 2011, long before this ever started up. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And it was by a well-respected management consultant. And as I was reading it, it's a very good reading, which I'll forward on to my, my colleagues. But it says, many organizations thrive despite weakness, venality, or tyranny at the top. In all but a few cases, the leaders only are able to influence their immediate reports and a few others. Their only role is uh, part of the story. The second, can, and it says, for any organization to go toxic, and this is what I believe has happened here with the NEB, it's gone toxic. There has to be an organizational structure that allows the toxicity to take root and then to flourish. Here is where transparency and accountability within corporate governance can help but also where it can hinder. And hinder because as the organizational checks are undermined over time, the organization starts to weaken, become vulnerable to corruption, and then becomes toxic. And this is exactly what's occurred here. But the reference point in this article, which I found amazing, was that the case study for the article is the decline and collapse of the Enron Corporation. And I thought, well, where have I heard that name before? And then when I took a look, well, the principles behind the pipeline proposal are two guys named Rich Kinder and Bill Morgan. And before they started up Kinder Morgan, they were part of the organization that is being used as a case study of a fish starting to rot from the head. So I leave that message with the NEB, and I leave it with the outgoing federal government today and I will forward this to my MP who can then forward it to all the various parties but I think what we're looking at is a fish rotting from the head. Councillor Dhaliwal. Thank you Your Worship. I, uh, just, uh, just following up Councillor Valko on the appointment of... Uh, you to clap that are you? No, no, <laughs> just, just a couple of other questions arising out of that one. I still think they need to be pointed out, Your Worship, is that um, uh, 
he comes from Rolf who said, who is Mr. Kelly? Like, he, this isn't a, a, a sort of ordinary appointment of somebody being appointed to a very highly prestigious organization, supposedly National Energy Board, and the Prime, Prime Minister has appointment. So you would think somebody would do some checking up. First of all, Mr. Stephen Kelly is a, a former first vice president of an energy consulting firm. So you think, you wanted to get some partial people working on this panel who would be able to draw out people's concerns regarding this project, and you wanted to put those people who really aren't loyal to energy consulting firms and serving the con energy uh, corporations. So that would have been the first red flag. And the next one was that it's the same Mr. Kelly who presented a 203-page report in support of Kinder Morgan's $5.4 billion project. That's being now supposed to be have a public hearing about. So your worship, you would think that Prime Minister would have some understanding and knowledge of that. And if he didn't, you would think he would have picked up the phone and called the chair of the energy board. Maybe they didn't know about him because they had already received this and they would have thought that something is fishy about this, as, as, as Councilor Volko said, do not make that appointment. And, but that was still done. And as, as Councilor Volko said, on the way to Rideau Hall, when this was done, sort of running away from everything else. And then, the worship, it took them, I guess, a good three weeks or something for the National Energy Board for themselves to realize on their own, on motion, that perhaps, you know, this is something that we should really take action on. You would think that this would have been immediate. You would think there would have been a little bit more a sort of immediately reaction to say, no, this isn't going to work for us rather than waiting three weeks. I would suggest to you, Your Worship, that this is a, a no coincidence. This is something that probably was done to that there's no public hearing that should take place during this election campaign period, which is now fully underway. Because knowing fully well that public in British Columbia have seen how NED operates, their process, what they have committed to, how the whole hearings have been sham, how the, uh, the interveners have been dropping out, saying already that things are not working well in, in terms of what it would be a fair hearing, Your Worship. That has been all documented well. But now that's not going to take place. And I would guess. When NEB said they're suspending this hearing, they didn't give it any date. I would, I would hazard to guess I think it's going to be after October 19th, most likely. I just have the suspicion. It wasn't just a two, two or three days kind of say, okay, let's get our act in here and we'll get on with it. But this isn't. So I think there are a number of questions that I believe need to be raised and talked about. Just, just no different than what's happening at the, the senators trial, etc., and all that, I think there are a few good things that the, the, the Prime Minister need to answer. Uh, but the other thing that this report, when this report's coming out, Your Worship, NEB also issued their conditions for approving the, the project itself. But I'm pretty sure I see there's a few more uh, speakers be, after me who will speak, but I'll leave it to that, uh, that Your Worship. The, the questions that were raised by City of Burnaby, the question that these are listed in here, pretty well become redundant because if the questions that were raised, NEB already thinks that, well, gee, uh, uh, I think that's a good question, but we'll get the answer after it's approved. So, so I think those folks who have put a lot of time in to put and become uh, interveners, had become completely dis disappointed and in, 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 uh, in disengaged in this process, Your Worship. I think whatever's left of this process need to be really rethought. I just will leave it at that. I think the, that City of Burnaby has been pointing out these things for now, uh, for a fair length of time, over a year and a half, is becoming, as Councilor Balco had said, worse and worse than it was before, Your Worship. Well, um, certainly, Councillor Dollywell, in your role as the president of the Union of BC Municipalities, um, you already have a motion from the UBCM 
that says the cities right across British Columbia have lost faith in the process. And I, I think that is very telling. When you have the National Energy Board um, receiving a motion from cities all across British Columbia where they say whether we are for or against the pipeline, we've lost faith in the process of the National Energy Board. That's a very serious condemnation and it's one that's being made by towns and villages and cities right across our province. In fact, across Canada, you were sure FCM also they took that resolution and approved that and process that. So the FCM again has approved the same motion? Yes. That's a, that's a, a great undermining of the ability of these organizations to achieve social license for these kinds of projects when cities and towns across the country have lost faith in their process. Councillor McDonnell. I uh, support exactly what the first two speakers said and, the, and they covered it pretty thoroughly. The Prime Minister knew that there was problems coming with this because I'm sure that the, especially in Burnaby and especially in the Lower Mainland and probably all BC is people are talking about it on the doorstep during this election and they're getting feedback and the polling is showing which direction their candidates are going and everything else. And I think this whole thing was orchestrated to delay it till after the election. But I think where he might have made a, bit, a little bit of a mistake is that the same as the uh, inquiries going on now, the trials going on with Senator Duffy, is that people will speak up and they're speaking out. And I think the citizens will speak up and they'll speak out for seeing the what it is is the They've been getting away with things because they can. And people think it's, as long as we tell them it's terrorism and, and it's the economy, we don't have to worry about anything else. And they're not giving enough credit to the average citizen, the average voter, to say, you know, I've had enough of this. And it is time for a change. And I think we'll find that, yes, it will be after the election. But I will not be surprised at all if it's a different person making the decision after October 19th. I think they threw the dice one too many times. <coughs> I think this whole thing was orchestrated right from day one. It's a way, how do we cancel those hearings? I don't want to have the senator's trial going on and the NEB flawed uh, hearings going on where the public is excluded. They can't even sit in and listen to what's being said. That They can't have an oral uh, discussion with uh, the, or debate with Kinder Morgan on the presentations they're making. You have to do it with a written submission. The whole thing is flawed right from day one, and the heat would just keep building. It wouldn't slacken off. It would get worse as it went on. But I'm going to give credit to the voters on this one. I think they've had enough, because I've heard enough people saying on the doorstep what they're hearing is, it is time for a change. They're tired of this stuff, and they're tired about what we're doing with the United States and everything else. We've got to get back and get into a government that we can respect for Canada. And right now, I don't think there's much respect for this government. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, I, uh, I hope that people keep this on the front burner for the election because I, I think it needs to be an election issue, and uh, I hope it's one here in the Lower Mainland and, and in fact, right across the country. Councillor Jordan. Uh, thank you, Worship. It's too bad because uh, this is an outstanding uh, report of how many, I think 100 pages, <laughs> um, that our staff has done all this work on it. And it's unfortunate tonight that we aren't dealing with the substance that's in this report because there's some really substantive uh, issues that need to be brought to the public's attention. And instead, we're not going to have that opportunity yet again because the hearings, such as they were, non-public, but hearings, um, are not going to proceed. And you know, as others have already mentioned previously, October um, 19th is drawing closer and closer and it, all of the issues that are raised in this report from our staff and from our legal counsel about, um, you know, the future of our community because of, of the potential of this pipeline are not going to be given the profile that they would have if these hearings ha had proceeded. And, and I think that's exactly, um, as others have already said, the reason 
the visa was cancelled. Now, I don't know how big a conspiracy theory um, you need to lay o over this to see, you know, where that came from or how that started, but it's pretty amazing that in basically a three, four week period, we've had going from uh, the Prime Minister's office appointing Mr. Kelly, the National Energy Board saying, oh, that's no big deal. He won't be hearing this case. He's going to be like in another office across the hall and he won't be involved in this in this process at all. So it's fine. He should be there, right? Then 10 days later, the NEB issues one of the pieces of this report tonight, the draft conditions around which the pipeline will proceed um, and then the conditions will follow after the fact. So they issue those conditions based on the evidence they've heard, based on the evidence that Mr. Kelly wrote and presented to them. Um, so they did that within 10 days of Mr. Kelly being appointed and everybody was like, wait a minute, how can you issue conditions when you haven't even heard the, the public yet? You haven't even had the hearings, but they, no, they didn't. Um, 12 days after he was appointed. And then now it's like uh, that old expression, uh oh, Houston, we have a problem. Right. And I think they basically, perhaps some of the lawyers in some building in Calgary went, wait a minute, um, this is an issue. And it's interesting to me because I actually like found out about Mr. Kelly from social media and a friend of mine who observes these matters in Alberta. And he sent me an email saying, you can't believe what the, they did. They appointed this guy and he knew who he was very well. Um, and actually before Mr. Harper called the election, I think the appointment was Friday and he emailed me on Saturday and said, you can't believe what they've done now. So, but now, and now we have them pulling out the rug from all of us and saying that the evidence that he put in on behalf of Kinder Morgan is tainted, so they have to redo it. So they have to go hire another consultant and, you know, fill in the blanks and take that out. But the, the question for me is, they built these conditions. They put out this hundred and how many? Forty-five conditions about the pipeline based on what? The evidence and the stuff that Mr. Kelly put in front of them. So if they're taking out Mr. Kelly's evidence, then they should be taking out the conditions, they should be taking out all of the other um, things that they've done. They should be like just sort of saying, okay, you know what, erase all of this, let's start over. Because this whole uh, process has been a sham and a scam. A lot of people pulled out of the process just recently. A lot of interveners, a lot of organizations said, had enough, this is, this is uh, the this is rigged, this is uh, not, you know, in anyone's interest to even participate anymore. Um, and so perhaps, you know, they were feeling that heat, but, and so now, now we have come to today where the, where the, um, the hearings have been, uh, have they said canceled or postponed? Postponed. Postponed, right. Uh, so, so that it, but it's not just that evidence to me that needs to be re, rethought and, and reworked. The decisions that the NEB has made, such as all of these conditions, based on that evidence, need to be said to be thrown out as well. So there's a, a whole, you know, multiplier series of events that have, have taken place in this short four weeks. Um, and to me, it, it just adds to, as we've said from the beginning and as others have said, the credibility of this whole process is now zero. And uh, if, it would, if it could get any lower it actually than zero, it actually uh, would, have, would be there now. So it's, uh, to me, as you said, we have to somehow keep this in front of the public so that they under, um, understand the implications and keep it on the agenda because I, I sincerely also believe that this is, this is all big P politics they didn't want to have demonstrations and opportunities for those kinds of things in our city in two weeks from now in the middle of an election campaign and the, and this was orchestrated to, to prevent that. So it's a very sad day actually for um, democratic processes in, in this country and even though we all um, didn't have faith in the process, we hung in there, we did our work, we've done our homework, our staff have worked 
tremendously long hours and diligently to be a part of that process and now it's all being shown to be a sham and a scam and it's very sad. And we've done all the work to respond to Mr. Kelly's report and other evidence and uh, and now that works start useless. Over. And, and how the board issued conditions so obviously they must have considered everything that Mr. Kelly wrote in order to issue those conditions that would mean that how do they pretend they never read that? I don't know how they pretend they never read that. And so it becomes part like pretending of their that the decision. jury didn't hear that evidence, right? Yeah. That's yeah, hard so to I, do. You know, it's one thing to ask a judge to do that, but to have a board member, you know, end up in a position where they have to pretend they didn't hear the evidence of someone who's sitting across the hall from them or that they think his evidence is worthless and he's sitting across the hall from them. I mean, those are impossible things. I was saying to the lawyer earlier that this process is one that is very confusing to anyone who comes from any other legal background because how do you issue conditions before you've even <coughs> considered whether or not you'll approve it? And, uh, and you know, I, the analogy I made, it's a little bit like the judge telling the prosecutor, all right, I'm going to convict him, but you better provide some evidence later on about why he should uh, be convicted. You know, that makes no sense to anyone. And, and so we've got a situation in which conditions come out before they've ever made a decision on whether or not the project should go ahead. And almost all of the conditions relate to the things that we said were issues that should be considered to not approve it. So they put them all off to the end of, till after the approval is granted. They've said, in effect, that nothing you've said could possibly change our mind about whether or not we approve it. And if it's frustrating. And if the NEB is, to quote, striking all evidence prepared by or under the direction of Mr. Kelly from the hearing record, then what do they base all these conditions on? A bunch of blank paper? I don't think so. Yeah, and how so do then the conditions need to be started over again too, which basically means the whole process needs to be started over. Yeah, and we should be getting costs for all the time we've spent dealing with all of that material for all of the interveners who've had to deal with that material. Good thing we didn't hire those policemen. No fault of ours. It's the board that's been uh, yeah. that's caused that delay. It's it's terrible. Councillor Calendino. Oh, thank you. Well, so far I've heard sham, scam, corruption at the top, tainted process, decision made a priori without consideration of uh, information, impartiality, etc., etc., etc. And all this, Your Worship, being uh, rammed down our throat in the name of public interest. It's being done in the public interest. I guess in my 55 years in this country, I never learned what in the public interest means. And it means that we don't consider, we don't do a risk assessment before we approve a project like that. The NEB is not interested in approving a risk assessment at all until, uh, except as a condition after they have approved the, the project. And what's the point of that, I'm wondering. Um, they have done no assessment of the environmental damage that it will be causing uh, to wildlife, to marine life, to residents on the slopes of Burnaby Mountain, to students uh, and residents at the top of SFU should there be a, a boil over and, and obviously uh, it's a very real um, um, thing that could happen uh, uh, at, the, at the tank farm if there is a boil over and, and obviously the uh, NEB is not uh, accepting the fact that, that there is a very real and actual risk that there can be a boil over uh, according to UK standards which NEB wishes not to look at at all. Um, we uh, are being sold this is in the public interest uh, in because there is an economic advantage. Well, let's see what the economic advantage is. These oil companies are given billions of dollars of tax breaks that could be used 
in providing social services that we've enjoyed in the past, but these tax breaks are taking away those billions that could be used for that. There are some people employed that pay taxes, yes, but it's not coming from the oil companies that are making huge profits out of that. Kinder Morgan itself does not pay a large amount of taxes to the Canadian government. In fact, in the, I believe it's le in the last year, it paid one and a half million dollars of taxes while it sent over $160 million of profits to the parent company down the states. I don't see that as being in the public interest in Canada, your worship. Uh, we talk of economic interest. Well, besides the tax break that these companies get, they also pay basically no royalty whatsoever. And I want to bring the example of uh, Norway. Norway has had a significant royalty base for the last 30 years that they produced oil in the uh, North Sea there. And they've managed to amass over a trillion dollars, which can be used to provide those services that here we are being deprived of more and more every single year. Uh, they have an excellent health system, they have an excellent education system, and now we're, it's being decimated year after year because we are giving tax advantage to the oil and gas companies and to other corporations. There is no public interest in the whole process, your worship. I have to agree that it is a scam and a sham that's going on here, and that people need to uh, wake up and make sure that uh, in, in two months when there is a, uh, an election that they think about the situation really uh, seriously and consider who to vote for, who will support their public interest. Now we know that in Burnaby the public is not in favor of this uh, uh, Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion. We know that many other cities along with Burnaby are raising objections to that. We know that the Union of BC Municipalities had taken a position against it because of the environmental damage and the risk to the population in the area. We know that even the FCM is in agreement with our position against the expansion of Kinder Morgan. We know that First Nations are against the expansion because of the, dam the potential damage that it can cause to the marine life and to their uh, traditional territory. Yet the NEB is ignoring all this position, is ignoring listening to people, is ignoring uh, having oral, uh, what's the term you use in legal? Cross-examination. Cross 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 None of that is happening in this process. It's a closed process. So for all intents and purposes, this is not in the public interest, as I consider public interest, Your Worship, and I'm sure as most people consider what is in the public interest. This is not, and I think it should be, canned. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I just want to be clear on this, is that the UBCM and the FCM have not voted to oppose the pipeline. They voted that they were opposed to the process that's being implemented by the National Energy Board. And Thank so you. they're not satisfied that it's been a fair process, but they haven't come to a determination on the project because unlike the uh, National Energy Board is that uh, many of these cities and towns across Canada haven't had enough information to be able to make a final decision on it. But they've come out clearly saying they do understand the process is flawed. And just on your your discussion about Norway, interestingly enough, I had a young master's student um, from a Norwegian university, a Canadian woman, uh, in my office interviewing me about the Kinder Morgan issue. And uh, sh university in Norway free. is free. It's free. And not only is it free for Norwegians, it's free for foreigners. And so she was attending university to do her master's degree in Norway because Norway was encouraging foreigners to come and learn at their university in order to expand the professional base of their country and to simply reach out saying that Norway was a, a land of education and knowledge. So it's, uh, it's very interesting that that's the way Norway has chosen to spend its money is by giving education free uh, to young people. On top of that, I wonder if the young lady told you that the Norwegian government along with the Finnish Norwegian even 
pay monthly salaries to university students to attend the university. There you go. I don't think that applies to foreigners. It does. Uh, it does. It does. Oh, I, do, I, have, I have seen it on Italian television. Italian students have gone there and there being given a monthly wage to go to the university there. Lovely. <coughs> um, Councillor Johnson. Chef, um, I uh, don't want to belabor this one because everybody's talked quite a bit about it. Uh, when I heard the, uh, the uh, action of the Prime Minister uh, a couple of days before he called the election, whereby he appointed Mr. Kelly and then suspended the uh, hearings, I actually thought it was a, a brilliant uh, um, position on behalf of the Conservative government to push the issue away until after the election. I uh, hope it goes away. Uh, after the election, they can come back and people will have forgotten about it and put it in place. I actually think it could backfire in the government and the NEB's uh, lap at this point. Um, the fact that it's been deferred and then they made up a, a, a conditional approval with a list of uh, conditions. Many of those conditions are, uh, are uh, pretty minor and pretty uh, meaningless. Um, what I think they've done is in taken a, a position where they tried to depoliticize the process, where in fact I think they're handing it to the uh, three opposition parties, the, uh, the Liberals, the NDP, the Green. They can, um, I think that uh, if, if a candidate chose, they could run with this one and it could actually become a bigger political issue than what's happening on the East Coast with the Senate right now. The, uh, when you listen to uh, Councillor uh, Calandino's comments at the beginning of his presentation tonight, it sounded like he was talking about the Senate. It just, I mean, it's, it's just a East Coast, West Coast issue. I think the government's trying to hide both of them. And um, I don't think that uh, the public should allow that ha to happen. I think uh, uh, if the uh, candidates in the upcoming provincial or federal election um, wake up and smell this one, I think it's a bigger issue than the Senate issue. So I, I, uh, I would I think we should actually challenge our, our uh, local candidates in, in Burnaby too, to take this on. So you're saying this was so Machiavellian as to be an intentional way to cause the hearings to be postponed I by appointing him? Think they, I think they, I do. I do think that they're trying to, they, they thought they could just kind of hide it away until after the election and then come back and surprise everybody with a decision. But I think it could actually work in our in our favor if if, if well that would be very that would be scope. very interesting if someone did that appointed someone just to make sure that the hearing goes sideways. But I can tell you, I'm sure our MPs will be looking into it because they they can't help but be caught up during this election campaign. And if the Duffy trial goes away for a little while, to be able to get their attention mm -hmm. focused on on what's gone on in this situation because this is. You know, I, I mean, I think anybody who's looking at the NEB must believe the NEB is incapable of organizing a two-car parade. And you know, they, they just seem to, they seem to be tripping over themselves every time they make a move. And mm -hmm. to trust an organization like that with billion-dollar expenditures in the future of energy in our country. Yeah. And I think, I think that the, if, if a candidate wants to be a member of the House of Commons on our behalf and possibly a member of the government, I think they should uh, stand up and be counted on this issue because I think it's important to Burnaby residents. Well, it really does scare you and, it won and you begin to wonder. I, I think a lot of us have faith that these institutions are there to serve us and to do the job properly and to ensure that public interest is protected. Yeah. I mean, I've always believed that. And, uh, and I think what we found out from the examination of the energy National Energy Board is this isn't true and what you've got to wonder is how deep does this go into the federal system how many of these boards act in this way in regard to giving approval to industry and projects that require the public interest to be protected and in essence what we're discovering is that this is a rubber stamp organization that asks only that these corporations do the very least Yep. required. At which point the federal the cabinet should make the decision themselves. If that's all it's going to be, then the, the government should make this. All right. Well, I, you know, I'm sorry we haven't gotten to the meat of the report tonight. We were talking mainly about the unusual action of postponing the hearings. I think if we come back 
for hearings later on, Mr. Moncur, we need to bring back this report so that we again can bring to the public's attention and to Council's attention the critical issues that we'll be raising in the hearings. So there's not much point at this stage going through those issues, but I commend the report to anybody who wants to look online at the issues. It's a very readable report that talks about some of the primary concerns that we have and the failure of the National Energy Board to deal with any of these concerns prior to approval and the simple fact that the National Energy Board shows every intent to approve this and deal with the real issues after they've given their approval and that to me is, uh, is an impossible process to have faith in. So there's uh, a receipt for information in regard to the report. Have we moved that? It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. No, we can't listen to people from the audience. I'm sorry. Um, but you're welcome to talk to councillors afterwards. 7.2. This is to seek Council's approval to update the Burnaby Bylaw Notice Enforcement Bylaw and to amend the offense section of certain regulatory bylaws to increase the maximum fine. Councillor Jordan. Uh, thank you, Worship. I, I just wanted to comment, first of all, that it seems that um, at page 127 and 129, we have a, a duplicate page for the, the clerk's reference. That we have sort of two page ones. I think at least in my package, I don't know if other people have it. I know you will, yeah. like, you will like 20 people don't have that problem. No, so. I've got a duplicate too. So I thought not only were we tripling the fines, we were doubling the amount of time <laughs> we find people on. But I just wanted to know that... Uh, the bigger problem is if they're different. Yeah, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> so after a thorough study, no, they're the same. Um, but I, I just wanted to point out that the this um, change in and increase in fines is and will likely be reported most specifically as a lot more detail um, and also increase in the fines having to do with water usage but it's not just water usage as the staff has been reviewing uh, some of the these bylaws that have been around for a very very long time and also expanding new areas that we're dealing with such as, such as in uh, recycling and waste disposal and and so in order to assist us enforcing in enforcing those uh, bylaws and also some motor vehicle uh, issues and noise issues there these these recommended um, penalty amounts are substantially being increased and for all these other areas as well so I'm sure when this is reported in the press etc it will focus on the fact that yes uh, we did used to have the lowest fines uh, for for what watering when you weren't supposed to be watering with things you weren't supposed to be watering with and all that um, and this substantially increases those and also introduces the level so that it's stage one it's one level at stage two it's a higher level and stage three a uh, higher level yet uh, for the fines so it introduces a different system of fines than we than we used to have but also um, it does cover some uh, updating of the penalty amounts for violation of other city bylaws so. Councillor Johnson Your Worship I think this is a uh, good report I think it's uh, very comprehensive if you look at the uh, rates of increases that they make sense in relation to the severity of the activity uh, such as uh, garbage and water I think that some ways we have to have these fines in place if, uh, because of situations that do occur on a daily basis um, I just wanted to point out um, I did look at the city of Surrey website today because I had heard that we were the lowest on the water side and uh, which we're substantially increasing it compared to our old fines. Uh, but I did look at City Street today, and their um, watering violation fines start at $3,000. And 
ten thousand dollars for a second offense. So still pretty competitive. Uh, we're still affordable um, in relation to uh, Germany. Saying that, I think that uh, uh, I don't think we need to go to certain level, but I just think there are uh, compared to our, our former watering fine of fifty dollars. I think uh, four hundred to five hundred makes a lot more sense. Sure, um we're trying to use our bylaws far more as an educational process to get cooperation from our citizens yes. than as a punitive process. I think it's the last resort for us to end up in a situation. And, and thankfully, it doesn't happen very often. Most people comply with uh, the bylaws. It's unusual that people work outside them. So I... Um, I think you can, uh, you can raise the fees or the fines extremely high, but uh, I think the bigger thing is for people to voluntarily comply. Yes, yeah, it's in everybody's interest to comply because we're doing it in the public interest. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. This is to request approval and funding for initiation of the 2016 Capital Infrastructure Program and completion of the 2015 Infrastructure Construction Program. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item four. And this is to seek council approval for the road closures and staff support for the 37th annual Christmas Toy Run to be held on Sunday, October the 4th. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. This is, a, uh, this is to approve the funding for a mural at the Canada Way Learning Centre as part of the 2015 City of Burnaby Mural Grant Program. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, and this is to approve the funding for a mural at the Bottle Depot at 3805 Kingsway as part of the... Uh, 2015 City of Burnaby Mural Grant Program. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 7. This is to obtain council approval to remove and or demolish the city-owned building at 4456 Percival Avenue. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 8. This is to obtain council approval to remove and or demolish the city-owned building at 3745 Manor Street. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 9. This is to request approval for the endorsement of the Burnaby Community Schools Strategic Plan. Councillor Calandino, you sat on the committee that considered the, con the plan. Yeah, yeah, very briefly, Your Worship, because I think the report is very, uh, it's explanatory in itself. Uh, I just wanted to say that it was a very good process which lasted about a year, and we had people from Parks and Rec, from school board, uh, both staff and management, and representation from council and, uh, and myself. Uh, and, you know, the first part of the process, we actually learned um, about the community school and how they started, etc. And we also learned that the demographic had changed and that perhaps the uh, community schools that we're operating now may not be in the best location. Uh, but the most important part of the report, Your Worship, is probably the proposed uh, key uh, direction for key strategic areas, which are uh, in uh, uh, item, I guess, uh, doesn't say what, but I would just give you the page number, I think, on page 170 in, in the book. Uh, and... You know, they're very good. They increase the uh, competencies of staff, and we all w wish that, and, and there are now community members that participate in community schools. But the most important one is increase youth leadership in community schools and non-community schools. And, and the intent of that is to make young people a little more responsible and participate in community life more than they do now by giving them leadership skills. Um, I, I think probably that was one of the best strategies that uh, was designed. And then the strategies, of course, are accompanied uh, uh, with objectives uh, and actions and outcomes in the following pages, Your Worship. And uh, uh, for anybody that's interested in uh, 
community of the schools, perhaps they should look online at this report and uh, learn something about community schools. Thank you, Councillor Calandino, and thank you to the and the members of the committee who sat down and worked on making sure that we were updated and focused on how our community schools were operating and and looking at the future development of community schools in our city. Mr. Vine made one minor comment, Your Worship, that we uh, also looked at how community schools operate in some other district in Greater Vancouver. And, and it, it seemed that in other districts they're more bureaucratic than we are here. We just have a community school coordinator in the specific school or what's beginning to develop is community of schools where it still is one community uh, coordinator but works out of one school and, and looks after perhaps the uh, Catchment High School and some other elementary school with the simple one coordinator rather than having a centralized uh, bureaucratic office. And we leverage a lot of volunteerism. Yes, we that. do. Very good. Questions. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 10. This is to request authorization for the city to enter into an agreement with the Burnaby School District for the contribution of the cost of playground upgrades as detailed in the report. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 11. This is to request approval for the renewal of the lease with the Capitol Hill Community Hall Association. Questions. Question has been called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 12. This is to request approval for the renewal of the lease with the Lockdale Community Hall Association. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 13. This is to seek council authorization to forward this application to a public hearing on September the 29th, and this is a low-rise multiple-family residential development in Brentwood Town Centre. Question. Questions called. All those in favor? Opposed? Huh? Oh, Councillor Dalywell. Sorry. That was from my own from before. Thank. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Worship. I just got a quick question on um, the staff on, on page 194 of the report, Your Worship. Uh, I, I'm just trying to understand this. That there are two bullets on the top of the page. It says, uh, Director of Engineering, this follows from page 193. Director of Engineering will assess the need for any further required services to the site, including but not necessarily limited to. The second bullet, the first bullet talks to the north side of the Lowheed Highway to Town Center standard for primary arterial, arterial road and, and including boulevards, sidewalks, etc. But then the following bullet, construction of an interim asphalt sidewalk. It, it just, uh, just why would this be an interim, sidewalk, an, an interim asphalt sidewalk? Is it something that the, that the developer would be doing later or, or this is something unusual. Why would this not be completed now? Uh, Your Worship, it's a section of sidewalk that's not on the development frontage. So the development frontage itself will be finished to the full standard. But there's a bus stop further to the east that uh, doesn't have a sidewalk or pedestrian uh, facility. So the developer is going to construct that off of his property frontage. Oh, so this is beyond the developer's property? Beyond his frontage, just to improve the public connection to that bus stop. Okay. Didn't see this one clearly in the report, so okay, if beyond that, so this is just an additional, okay. All right. Thank you. Just make sure that even though they construct their sidewalk that people can still get to the bus stop. Yeah, no, that, that's fine, Your Worship. Right. Questions been called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. This is authorization to forward this application to a public hearing on September 29th, and this is a multi-tenant light industrial development in the Big Bend development plan. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. This is to inform Council of a request for development of a new industrial building under existing zoning in the Royal Oak Community Plan. This is 5507 Dorset Street. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. This is to provide Council with information on construction activity as reflected by the 
building permits that have been issued for the subject period. And this is over 500 million again already this year, so another big year. Um, I think it's pretty close to the numbers from last year at this time, which was uh, slightly above our biggest ever. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We still continue to have this significant development in our community. You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 17. And this is a this is to obtain council approval for the official sister city visit. That is to both our sister cities in Wasong, Korea, and in uh, Kishiro, Japan. So we've managed to couple both sister city visits into one trip, which is again pretty efficient use of, uh, of our time away. You ready? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. This is to obtain council approval to award a contract for property management services at the Deer Lake Center. Councillor Dalliwell? Yeah, Your Worship, I, I believe this is a typo. I just want to clarify though. Uh, in the report, the first, first uh, uh, sentence says, Closing time on 2012, August 01. I, I'm assuming this wasn't three year old. Closing is 2015. Oh, just, just uh, yeah, it's possible that maybe a three year old bid, but, but I, I just thought it maybe it'd be just a typo out of curiosity. Whose baby is this? But this is a now three years later that we're letting out contact? That's correct. This is u unusual or this is, this is sort of common practice? It is unusual. Um, the first Thank you for the clarification. All right. You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. This is to obtain council approval to award a construction contract for culvert and bank rehabilitation for the Stony Creek tributary. Question. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. This is to obtain council approval to award a contract for the supply and delivery of a single axle sewer flush truck. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. <laughs> um, 21. This is to obtain council approval to award a construction contract for the 2015 local area service program and other construction work. Right. Questions been called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Yeah, and revised item 22. And this is uh, to obtain council approval to award contracts for the supply uh, and delivery of various light trucks. And this is to Metro Motors Limited White Spot Service, doing business as Maury Nissan and Merton Nissan Limited, and the total is 520000 dollars six hundred five five hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and five dollars and twelve cents right you ready for the question all those in favor opposed and carried um, this is to change the signing officers on city bank accounts it's been moved in second question all those in favor opposed and carried and we have an on table item this is in regard to Simon Fraser University's 50th anniversary. And this, uh, this is a council approved. The option is outlined in this report in recognition of SFU's 50th anniversary. This was discussed earlier in camera by council and uh, approved and the report was brought into open council as quickly as we could because 
the anniversary date is coming up and uh, this is a commitment to fund a meeting place at uh, Simon Fraser University that will be constructed. It is a uh, pyramid with uh, benches that will be installed at the top of the pyramid and it's intended to celebrate the relationship between the city of Burnaby and uh, Simon Fraser University on its 50th anniversary by showing our uh, respect for students and their ability to meet together and that uh, the city and the university facilitate the opportunities for us to work together and to, uh, to improve our city and to improve our educational institution. I think this will be a beautiful site and it's been the project uh, has been a result of work that's been done between our staff and SFU staff to find an appropriate way to recognize our, uh, our long relationship between the educational institution and the city of Burnaby. Right, is there any discussion on this? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. A motion the committee rise and report. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Motion to adopt the report of the committee. All those in favor, opposed, and carry. Um, bylaws, Councillor Dollywell, please. Sorry about that, Worship. <laughs> You're on a roll tonight, too. Second and reading. <laughs> I move that bylaw numbers 13500, 13501, 13502 be now introduced and read three times. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Second reading, I move that to bylaw numbers 13489, 13490, 13491, 13492, 13493, 13494, 13495 be now introduced and read a second time. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Consideration and third reading. I move that bylaw numbers 13421, 13432, 14338 be now read a third time. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Reconsideration and final adoption. I move that bylaw numbers 13302, 13496, 13497. Be now reconsidered and finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, and the corporate seal affixed thereto. Been seconded. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Thank you, Councillor Dollywell. Welcome. And uh, we have a notice of motion, Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Worship. I've presented this notice of motion and circulated um, to all my colleagues some background information about it. They may have forgotten that now because that was a month ago. Uh, but basically this is a, a fairly straightforward resolution being circulated uh, to other cities in the country in support of a national pharmacare strategy. So um, during this election period, and I know it's tough to get the attention of <laughs> there's so many um, issues on the agenda um, of various organizations that need, you know, to be, to have the attention of the federal candidates and the federal government, but, but this is one that is, um, in my opinion, a good policy for our country and good financially for cities. And so the background information I circulated, you know, shows you that that we can actually save eight billion dollars a year to businesses and cities uh, in the cost they're now paying for for uh, pharmacare, pharmaceutical insurance programs, um, and have that converted into a pharmacare strategy that would be best for all Canadians across the country. So 
So I would hope uh, that my colleagues around the table could see fit to support that and this resolution calls on, ask Burnaby to call on UBCM, FCM, etc. cetera, uh, to support these proposals as well. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Your Worship, I have uh, just one small suggested amendment. I'm wondering, uh, being that we're in the middle of a federal election, if it wouldn't be appropriate to send a copy of this uh, to all federal candidates running for Burnaby also seeking their support. All right, is there a seconder for that amendment? Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Oh, just that uh, I saw a, an interview with the head of the Canadian Medical Association the other day and they were saying that the, uh, their polling shows that Canadians uh, overwhelmingly support this concept. And some of the politicians are a little bit gun shy on, on uh, they understand that there's economic savings to it, but I'm trying to, to go for it, so I think a little push my button. All right, you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. On the motion as amended, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. New business. Yeah. Councillor Dollywell? No, Your Worship, that's left over from previous. Councillor Jordan. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Just in, in respect of the purple pages, on the August 11th package, um, number 11, there's a, a, a letter from uh, Simon Challenger, QP Local 23, read the United Way Loan Rep Program, and don't we usually require a motion of council to approve yeah, that? We did. We did? We already approved it. Oh, so we, it, so this is just naming the, their candidate. We approved. Now they've told us who it is. Thank you very much for that. Okay, uh, I didn't recall that. What item one? <laughs> item one. Oh, the letter from Councillor Dollywall, president of <laughs> UBCM. No. <laughs> uh, and just one, one other uh, issue is that um, at the last meeting we had Councillor Volsko ask for a memo from staff with regard to water. And uh, we received an excellent document in our packages uh, from staff about the plans from Metro Vancouver and the analysis and everything around the region about future considerations for water in, in the region. And I just would like to see if there's some way we could publicize that document and have it available like on the website or something. I've already sent it to a couple of my friends who were freaking out that, you know, they're never going to have any water again. <laughs> I say, okay, no, really, there's, there's a plan here. <laughs> and there is opportunities for accessing additional water. And uh, I think it was a really excellent report. It had lots of graphs and pictures, which is my favorite thing. And uh, I, would, I think it would be useful for those of our citizens who are worried that if La Nina and the Nino and all those things continue to happen, that what, is, what will we be doing in the region for, for water into the future? So, so it's, it was a great report and I appreciate the effort that, that went into that, but it's not, uh, it's not in our public packets. So. I, uh, I think Metro Vancouver should probably do something that gives people a better understanding of the issues. And uh, and disseminate it wild, widely. I think. It's oh, but I'm on the committee. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's going to go on our website, Councillor Jordan. And, okay. And then uh, and then we'll we'll try to encourage Metro to make sure, because that's not the intention here. Is that looking after our water when we're in in the summer is an important issue, and making sure we're careful with our water. Um, and but I don't see this as being a threat that we're going to have difficulties in being able to supply water in the future. But people are afraid yeah. of that. So. so we need to calm people down and make sure they understand the ah. issues. And This has been a very unusual hot summer and I, I don't know that it predicts any futures. That it's, uh, I think we'd have to see much more tracking than this to come to the conclusion that it's a, it's a significant change in climate. I hear you. All right. Okay. I hope that's right. And with no further new business, Seven. it's been moved and seconded. All, you, all those in favor, opposed, carried. And thank you very much to council and staff and everyone who is with us today in the audience.